known quotes of Jesus or lesser known teachings of Jesus is uh, what this sermon series was. And I must admit, when I first saw it, I was like, lesser known quotes of Jesus, that exists? And then I thought about it and I look at the environment we're in and 100% it's lesser known teachings and quotes of Jesus these days. And which, which makes this job exciting, right? To be able to say lesser known quotes of Jesus, lesser known teachings of Jesus and to kind of be upset that that's a reality and then be presented with this today. And so again, and I, I like to start all of them this way, I want this to be about you and God. All right. Too many times when we go to a place, it's like every time we're soaking something in, we're thinking about our neighbors, we're thinking about our family and other people they wished were hearing this. I can guarantee you it's you individually that needs to hear it. Guarantee you. In the times that we're in, this message is very confusing. Most people don't understand what it even means. Powerful if you did, and we would tell our faces we were excited about it if we knew. So we'll see which ones of you get excited about it. John 12:25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, to save you the time, a lot of people read this and they think, okay, cool, so being depressed ought to be the way it is. Being suicidal ought to be the way that it is. And that's not true, even though depression and suicide is up. It would be down if this is actually what you did. Because he said, love your life in this world, you'll lose it. If you hate your life in this world, you will gain it for eternity. And we're going to spend the rest of the time trying to figure out which of these three categories you fit in. We'll get to that in a minute. First of all, life. Let's figure out if you just typed into your phone that you're on a whole lot more than you're in prayer, what your phone would tell you the definition of life is. Let's read a couple of these funny definitions of life. Life is defined as any system capable of performing functions such as eating, metabolizing, excreting, breathing, moving, growing, reproducing, and responding to external stimuli. Now, if that's life, it shouldn't be hard to hate, right? It shouldn't be hard to hate if that's all it is. But honestly, this is what a lot of people do, right? This is about all they do. Because you were dead in your transgressions and sins before made alive in Christ. So before you're made alive in Christ, there's what your definition of life is. I would hate it if I was you. Next one. Life could be defined as a self-sustaining chemical system that is capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Such a definition of life implies that autotrophic organisms such as cyanobacteria and plants are clearly alive. You notice it doesn't say people in there, right? Because they're not clearly alive these days. A lot of people go through their days and it's about as meaningless as it can possibly be. You'd be better off an AI robot than you would be a human being. Next one. Life is co-eternal with matter and has no beginning. Life arrived on earth at the time of earth's origin or shortly thereafter. Life arose on the early earth by a series of progressive chemical reactions. Such reactions may have been likely or may have required one or more highly improbable chemical events. Again, this goes back to the nothing created everything model of life, which a lot of people do live in our society. And we're gonna see if that is you today. So we go, we're gonna shift from science to theology. Because theology is important, but most people aren't very good at it. And when I say good at it, they study the Bible, but they don't understand the word of God. This book is not a book, it's the alive, living, active word of God, but a lot of people are gonna have to tell their faces that's what it is, because what you would embody would not be what American Christianity embodies at all. Inspired by God when written by man, better be inspired by God when read by man or you'll miss it all. And that's why Jesus spoke in parables is most people aren't going to understand what he's really saying. They're going to claim to and they're going to live a life with no fruit. And that's what a lot of people do. But let's listen to C.S. Lewis as he talks about shifting from the scientific way of thinking about life to the theological Christian Jesus way of thinking about life. I can understand how men should come by observation and inference to know a lot about the universe they live in. If, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology as a whole, then not only can I not fit in Christianity, but I cannot even fit in science. If minds are wholly dependent on brains, and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry, in the long run, on the meaningless flux of the atoms, I cannot understand how the thought of those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. And this is, to me, the final test. This is how I distinguish dreaming and waking. When I am awake, I can, in some degree, account for and study my dreams. The dragon that pursued me last night can be fitted into my waking world. I know that there are such things as dreams. I know that I had eaten an indigestible dinner. I know that a man of my reading might be expected to dream of dragons. But while in the nightmare, I could not have fitted in my waking experience. 
The waking world is judged more real because it can thus contain the dreaming world. The dreaming world is judged less real because it cannot contain the waking one. For the same reason, I am certain that in passing from the scientific point of view to the theological, I have passed from dreaming to waking. Christian theology can fit in science, art, morality, and the sub-Christian religion. The scientific point of view cannot fit in any of these things, not even science itself. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. If you understand Jesus' parables, you also probably have chills as you listen to what that is. Because again, life was nothing before being connected to Jesus Christ. Not pretending to know that he exists, which most people do in our American culture. No, the embodiment of what a sanctified Christian would look like would be one of these three things and nothing else. Are you an atheist? Anybody willing to raise their hand in here? You're here to get some hope in 2023, so you stumbled into a church called Light of the World. Any atheists in here? Now, most of you are going to actually embody more of an atheist than the third thing, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Anybody want to say they're a self-professing believer in here? I love it that nobody will do that. I love it. The trap is perfect. So everybody in here is a radical disciple of Jesus Christ is what that's supposed to say, by the way. A radical disciple of Jesus Christ. There is no other type. He asks us for radical things. He asks us, if we love our life, we'll lose it. So lose it for him, we'll gain it for eternity. You're either a radical disciple of Jesus Christ or you may as well be an atheist. This self-professing believer thing is the reason why our country is in the state it's in, not because somebody sits on a fake throne in Washington, D.C., and we'll get to that in a little bit. That's not what it's about. It's about we got a bunch of dead men and women walking because you're dead in your transgressions and sins before made alive in Christ. You are a radical disciple or nothing. And in our country, it's pretty much nothing. There's many more people in other places that are getting served something up on a platter that will lead to these other things we talk about, but not to a radical disciple of Jesus Christ willing to lose his life in this world to gain it for eternity. If you're not willing to do that, you don't believe in eternity anyways. Neither do atheists. Y'all are in the same boat. So here we go. John 12, 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We're going to couple that with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Now, really quickly, let me tell you, that means that you have an engine that doesn't run on the same fuel, or you do. And most of the people that I run into that pretend to be Christians these days are still running on the old fuel. And again, this is about you and him, so don't lie. You're going to see that you do too in some ways. And again, we're still in this flesh body, so it's going to take sanctification for the entirety of our lives to look more like a disciple of Jesus Christ than an American patriot. Okay, And we're going to get to that in a minute. So the way we're going to do it, the beautifully inescapable trap of Scripture If you ever stumble into a class I do or come into a sermon that I do, I have too many scriptures to even be able to get done in the time allotted. So I have to talk really fast. Hopefully it'll keep your attention. But it's an inescapable trap in his word. So if I speak opinions, I could be a tree or a cat these days. But if we're in his word, you're either a radical disciple of Jesus Christ or you might as well be an atheist, and I'll prove it to you in his word. Let's do a picture of the Ten Commandments now. The Ten Commandments these days um, serve as this an impossible thing to do, right? It should. You look at it and you say, man, I cannot live a life like that. And that's actually the point. The people that pretended to do that, Jesus didn't like very much. This is supposed to be a mirror to show you how ugly you are, right? A mirror to show you how ugly you are. Paul talks about it in Romans, if you want to study it more, that this just shows you how terrible you are. And then Jesus comes and intensifies it beyond being able to complete these, but we still have Christian communities on a low level trying to pretend they do these. But again, I'm going to prove to you individually that you do not do these. And again, we don't want that. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So today you will be in an inescapable trap of his word. So the Ten Commandments, a couple of them you're breaking every single day, we'll show in a minute, but let's go to Matthew 5, 17 through 20. 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers, of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that's a lot. We could do a sermon series on that one right there. It's crazy. Any competitive people in here? Raise your hand. Any competitive people? Okay, now we got some hands raised. We did it with the competition. I love it. We got it done. And I love that you admitted it because he creates something in a competitive person right here, right now, that he doesn't do any other place in Scripture. The other places, there's this conundrum, right? It's like, well, the least is going to be first or the first is going to be last, and there's this and there's that. And it's like, who, what's happening? Here, he tells you, those who practice and teach all. All of these things will be the greatest. I don't stand up here because there isn't things that I've done to master things that he asks me to. But I don't get distracted by the world as much as I used to. I look to him all the time and say, what do I need to do to be righteous enough in your eyes to stand up and teach a congregation of people? And if you're doing that for other people, you got the log in your eye, don't take a speck out of theirs. But he gives it right here. If you're practicing and teaching these things, not just teaching these things. There's a lot of people these days just teaching these things. And you can tell when they talk about it, they're serving you up the worldly stuff and not the kingdom stuff. And your righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, or you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Sounds like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law certainly did not make it to heaven, just by his word, though. So how does your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law? The only way is Jesus Christ, connected to the vine. Apart, me, apart from me, you can do nothing. But that's connected to Jesus. That's not coming once a week to check the box for your insurance policy for eternity. You might get there and he say he never knew you. And we're going to go over that in a little bit too. This is about embodiment. This is about him, not the world. That's about him and not being plugged into this four hours a day and maybe four hours a year in prayer. That's not what he asks of us. He asks us radical things, so we have to be radical in the way that we see it. So now what? Let's find out what you love about your life. Give me the picture. Man, if that isn't convicting, you probably don't understand the way that you tick. That is one of the main things Jesus teaches on. That is one of the main things that prosperity gospel bends all the way. I'll give you a quick hint. You, we were programmed by God himself in the world, bent to the world. We have his word, each other, in prayer to bend back. Prosperity gospel preachers are like, well, they're already there, so we'll just push them all the way down. And the next thing you know, you're submitted to a church that's not feeding good food. You cannot do both of these at the same time. There is no way to do both of these at the same time. Not says me, says him. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Again, it's the love of money. And very few people can accumulate money and not start to love money and then start to pretend that they don't and then start to pretend that the time that they spend isn't more in their career than it is in the church. And when I say church, I don't mean a building. I mean with a body of believers, the body of Christ, talking about God all the time. Not just coming to church, pretending to celebrate what we know one day a week. No. Out there talking about it. Everywhere that we are talking about God. Saying, hey, you, you, you having a rough time these days? So is everybody else. Let me show you the solution. But instead, they're so worried about their careers and stuff, so paying attention to politics and everything else because that's what runs their money, that they're distracted and they're not focused on God. But if you love your life, you'll lose it. If you lose it for him, you'll gain it for eternity. So if you like this world more than that, you don't believe in eternity. You don't believe in Jesus. And if he's the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, we know where that's headed. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What I love about the way he does it in his inescapable trap of his word is he just reiterates things. It's like, no, no, no. You either love money and hate me, or you hate money and love me. Now, again, that's not living in depravity. He feeds the birds he's going to feed you. That's not, leading in, that's not living in depravity. That's you will always have what you need because God is your father in heaven. What you want should change. Okay? I know that nobody's ever frowning on a jet ski. I used to say that all the time. Okay? But 
at the same time, those people are frowning at night after that jet ski's all turned down and everything else, and they go into their mansion where they shower like all of us do, and then they go lay in the same beds we all do, and they wake up doing the same thing on a loop that we all do. There's nothing different in them and us, except that they have less of a chance to get to heaven than a camel does to go through the eye of a needle, Right? It's impossible, and we're going to read that in a minute. So the point is not depravity on one side. It's not to love and worship money. It's to look at Jesus instead. It's to say, I trust that you're going to provide what I need and my family needs. What I want has changed. I can tell you and I can promise you that if six years ago somebody came back in time and said, in the future, you drive a white Honda Accord, I'd say, did I have a brain injury? What happened? I was on a success mountain. But so was everybody else that was there that was terribly miserable, never had fulfillment, joy, or anything. And I was like, okay, if it's not here, then maybe it's here. And what I found is that base camp over here, there's more power, love, sound, mind, fulfillment, joy, abundance, and everything promised than at the top of this one. And Tom Brady would tell you that. Three Super Bowls, $100 million, married to a supermodel, American dream. And he said, I hope this isn't all there is. And here we are, some of us still, chasing that instead. That's crazy. Jesus is better. He says it in his word, and it's the truth in the way that we live our lives. Matthew 9, 16 through 26. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. A couple things that you have to see in this is that this man said he was doing everything else. So Jesus kind of skipped ahead because he's Jesus, he's God in the flesh, and he's like, okay, okay, whatever, here's your thing. Here's the thing that's between you and me. Give that up and you can follow me. That's not the same for everybody, but for a lot of people it is. He goes for that thing. You'll know it during Lent time, right? You give him that second thing, right? It's like, oh, I gotta give up something for Lent. Oh, but not that. (laughs) I'll go for that second thing. Quick hint, God wants that first thing. And he doesn't want it just during the time of Lent, he wants it forever because that's so important to you that you couldn't even give it up for a time period. It's crazy. That's loving your life here. You'll lose it for eternity unless you believe in eternity. And then you'll be sanctified and formed closer to the image of Jesus Christ who slept in a tent on the ground, God in the flesh. And we think we're supposed to live in what? A tent on the ground too if we were doing it correctly. Yes, but none of us do. So that's the point. We will have what we need, what we want should change. And if it doesn't, then you love that symbol more than you love Jesus Christ. And that's a truth within you that you have to work out. That's what he's going for, or he might be going for one of these other things. Is it Jesus or family? Okay, Jesus or family? Because again, this is confusing to a lot of people. But if you had your priorities right, and I asked you, and you told me like a good Christian would, most people would say God, family, career. And even though they were lying when they said it, that's also incorrect. That's not how it should be. It should be God, then God in your family, then God in your career. So that you're not making the mistake of a ton of Christians that are better atheists than they are a self-proclaimed believer who are trying to fit God into their meaningless schedules. If you're trying to fit God into your meaningless schedule, then you have a meaningless schedule. If your schedule is God and you're trying to fit the meaninglessness into that, then you have it correct. But that's why narrow is the path and few find it, not wide is the gate that leads to eternity that we think in America it is. Oh yeah, I get to do my career and I get to take care of my family and I get to do all of this stuff. And when I have time once a week, I'll come give time to you, Lord, who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be reconciled to a perfect holy God. You don't understand that concept if you're trying to fit God into your meaningless schedules and your meaningless lives without a minute dead in your transgressions and sins before made alive in Christ means we've got a bunch of Pinocchio wooden boys running around in the church because nobody's teaching these things. They want to serve you up what you need. And if I serve you up what you need, I tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, you can be rich and famous and everything else and be a radical disciple of Jesus Christ, even though that's not what he says. It's not what he says. 
You will have what you need, what you want will change. And then with Jesus and family, if they're trying to come like right there, it's like it's family or career and then God down here. But let's see what he says about family. Luke 12, 49 through 53. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family, divided against another, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Amen? Man, we just came off a holiday season where a lot of you spent time with family you don't even like. I mean, we've got in-laws on here. Right? I, I, I live in the times where it's like I have great in laws, I'll say, right? I, I enjoy them, but not everybody does. And it, it, there's a split because if each and every one of us isn't God first, God in our family, God in our career, it's hard to hang out with you when we are, right? I don't want to hear about all that boring stuff that doesn't mean anything to my eternity, that is my little hundred years max here, but people still tell me about it. They still send me the stuff nervously, hopefully these days, because I don't care, and you shouldn't either. Because if you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose it for him, you'll gain it for eternity. So if you don't, you don't believe in eternity. Luke 14, 25 through 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It's all of this, okay? If anyone doesn't hate, by the way, in the Greek is a lesser love before you think this is a biblical contradiction, okay? In the Greek, it's a lesser love. You have to love your family less than God. And that's a truth that we're gonna get to in a minute. And if you did, you'd love your family better. But not very many people love their family, right? Because again, God isn't first and then God in their family and then God in their career. So they're miserable, wretched things trying to pretend they're not, right? Just like the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Yeah, my favorite one. Is this your idol? Especially these days. Here it is. Yeah, I'll just let it sit there for a minute. I can't help but look at it too. It, <laughs> this one's a funny one, especially in our area. You know what I mean? Because surely a disciple is only a right-wing conservative, yeah? That has to be what it is. Oh, my goodness. I can't tell you the, the, the amount of times that, like, I hear about this still, you know? I hear about this all the time. And it's madness, and it's crazy, and it's divisive. It promotes division, is what it does, and you pay attention to that one on the left more than you pay attention to that one on the right. And some of you can't lie and say that you don't, where if you paid attention to the one on the right more than the left, the left would be better. One nation under God wouldn't just be on the money, which is kind of funny, it's on the money, yeah? It's not true, it's not real, you know it. We have entire church denominations splitting over abominations coming over to the church because y'all are so distracted by this right here. It's the magician's assistant if you didn't know, right? It used to be a woman in a dress was the magician's assistant. Now it's a man in a dress is the, is the magician's assistant. And we're more excited about that than we are about Jesus, including me sometimes. I was an alpha male athlete growing up. I hate that specific abomination that's coming in and splitting up the church, but there's nothing weaker than that either. And weakness is splitting the church apart because people are more focused on the thing on the left than the thing on the right. Because if we were disciples, radical disciples of Jesus Christ and patriots, our country wouldn't have got to this place. But it's a bunch of bench warming Christians more focused on the flag than Jesus Christ, the reason why we're in this. So thank yourself for where it is. Because there's people out here pretending they're doing the good work, but they're doing the good work for the one on the left and not the one on the right. And it's why we are where we are. You couldn't split us up or divide us if we were radical disciples of Jesus Christ and patriots at the same time. But we got a bunch of patriots that aren't disciples at all. They're the self-professing believers closer to an atheist than they are radical disciples of Jesus Christ. Some of you might be sitting in here. I hope it hurts. It's the truth. The one on the right is, has power over the one on the left, not vice versa. And I'll show it to you in his word so that you can understand it plainly. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Okay, so again, the pride of life comes from those two. Which one is it? This one, this country, your comfort zone, or not? Because I don't know if you know, but you watch the news, so you probably do. There's places where people are getting murdered for saying they're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you're worried about the heat getting turned off. 
I don't know what to tell you. That's embarrassing. It's sick. It's gross. I hate to be a part of it. But I am in the war, the real one. That's not the real one. The one on the right is, says he, we're in a spiritual war, not a physical one. We're in a spiritual war. So if we become radical disciples of Jesus Christ, we could save the country. But if we don't, then it's Sodom and Gomorrah and it's given over to its sin anyways. We'll celebrate as we get fed to lions. And then we'll go spend eternity with our Father in heaven. Congratulations, we win or we win. And our win and our victory has to do with what Jesus Christ did for our sins and nothing that you did anyways. So stop disrespecting him for doing the one on the left instead of the one on the right. It's madness. And let's see where the power lies. John 19, 7 through 12. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. And I'd say, I don't care. And Pilate said, okay, I might as well do it because I serve Caesar over Jesus Christ, the son of God, the creator of the universe, the king of kings and Lord of lords. And we do it again. We look at that and we say, oh my gosh, I wouldn't want to be Pilate. You are. Strap it on. You are that. You see power in the left and not on the right. And no pun intended, okay? The truth of the matter is, if we were radical disciples of Jesus Christ, we'll save this country. Yes, we will. We won't be divided like we are all over the place, letting the pettiness pandemic ruin us because of the magician's assistant. We'd go help those people, not kick them while they're in a bear trap of their own making. Because they are in a bear trap of their own making. They're, They're an abomination to God, and then they put a pride flag on it too. They're in a double bear trap, and us as disciples of Jesus kick them in the face and try to work them out of the bear trap instead. It's craziness, it's madness, but it's based on the left and not the right, that's why. It's based on the left and not the right in both cases if you want it to be that way. But the truth of the matter is divide and conquer is the enemy's plan. And that promotes division. And that promotes coming together, but narrow is the path and few find it. And we have to look, where was the power, he said. The uppercase P power is in our Father in heaven who is our Father in heaven and loves us. So he disciplines us. This country's being disciplined, and rightfully so, because it looks at the left and not the right. So congratulations, bench-warming Christianity got us here. We can get off the bench and save it if there's 10 righteous, right? But we look around and see, even in the Christian circles, even the leaders in the Christian circles aren't speaking truth the way they should. They feed you up the same thing you like to be fed up all the time to. Luckily, your founding pastor does serve up the same thing they're serving up out there and then cures it with scripture on the screen every week. So do you pay attention to what he says when he talks about the politics and the way that it is, or do you pay attention to the scriptures on the screen that cure it? Because I just gave you one. There is no power in the fake White House throne that isn't given to them by our Father in heaven if we claim to believe. Are you a self-professing believer, or are you a radical, radical disciple of Jesus Christ? We'll find out when you go home today and think about this. He did not come to save Rome, save you from Rome. He came to save you from sin. He did not come to save them from temporary agony here, but from eternal agony in hell. If you are here today and you weren't an atheist or a self-professing believer, then you claim to believe in eternity. Then your actions ought to speak so. Because I know that 100 to eternity, I know where the alligator mouth goes because I took kindergarten math. Okay? The biggest number you could think of is closer to zero than eternity. So why in the world would you worship the one on the left and not worship the one on the right? I'll tell you why. You don't believe in the one on the right. That's why. Because if you believe in the one on the right, it doesn't matter what we have to face. They were getting fed to lions and lit up like candles and still claiming to follow the one on the right. You can't claim to follow the one on the right because you might lose that dollar sign. That's crazy and that's your idol and that's what you covet. And he said all the law and prophets hang on these commands that we're going to put you in in a minute. But Matthew 10, 32 through 39, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. 
If you aren't serving the one on the right over the one on the left, then you don't believe in eternity. How could you? Because I can't care what happens to me in this little hundred years max if I believe in eternity. I can, be, I can promise you that. I can promise you that. And so what we have to do is the greatest commandment automatically solves this dilemma. Surprise, surprise. But also surprise, surprise, I challenge you. Go talk to people that go to other churches and just ask them, what is the greatest commandment? And be prepared to be embarrassed as they don't know. And the reason it's embarrassing that they don't know is all the law and prophets hang on these two. Anytime a teacher of the law and a Pharisee comes to try to catch Jesus up and he says, hey, what's the greatest commandment? That's probably when you want to tune in in your little one year through the Bible so you can tell your friends you did that. That's where you really want to tune in, right? That's where you actually want to say, what did he say? That would be my question if I had never read it. What did he say? Well, let's see what he said when he got asked that. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And there's people going to Bible studies for like 100 years of their life, and they don't know what the greatest commandment is. They surely don't because they don't exude it. There's no fruits of the Spirit these days on fire for God. There's this let me go and get the knowledge and tell my friends that I did it. It's like where's the embodiment? That's why I say tell your faces we won all the time. Y'all know we won, right? Have you ever been a part of a war you knew you already won? Would your faces look the way they do all the time? Would you need to go talk to a counselor or a therapist or take a pill if you thought you won the war already? But you did, and nothing that you did. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins so that we could be reconciled to a perfect holy God. And we repay him by focusing on things that aren't him. We repay him by coming here once a week, though, and we listen to the music, and we listen to a teaching, and we forget it on our way to lunch. And there's no embodiment People don't come to classes to learn how to do a thing. They learn to classes that they can put it in their brains what's going on. You put it in your brains what's going on all the time by yourself. Don't come to church to do that. Come to church to learn how to be a radical disciple of Jesus Christ who goes out here and does something with what you claim to know. Not to sit in here and pretend with everybody else. It's not what we do. It's not what we should do. But again, the greatest commandment is loving God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength in some translations. And a lot of people don't even know the difference in those. So we've got a spread of them. We've got PhD theologian Pharisees over here with no love for God in their heart, but it's in their supposed mind. And we've got people over here supposedly in their heart, but don't have it in their mind, so it's off the rails. And you're lucky to be in a church where your founding pastor serves up both, but most people don't know it because they only come once a week on Sunday to hear the music and hear the teaching and forget it on the way to lunch and go back into their career that they care more about than God. To go back to the news at their house where they care more about politics than they do about God. And I know when they start to tell me and my brain starts to hurt and then I have to politely say, um, I don't care. He told me in Timothy what this world was gonna be like. I'm not surprised that it is you are because you pay attention to them because somebody's gonna rescue you from that. I agree, but he's not a person at all who's gonna rescue us from that. So I don't need to be rescued from that. He didn't come to bring peace, he came to bring division of people that believe in him or don't, who will be radical in the times that we have to be. Let me tell you something you may not know, I want it to be the worst president every time. Because when it's the worst president every time, we have a need for God. When we think it's a good one, we settle into our little comfort zones and pretend to know God. Right now it's exciting to be a Christian radical disciple of Jesus because it looks different. In 2019 it all looked the same. But then they threw the fear trap at you, and most people fell for it. But I remembered that God didn't grant me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if I have that embodiment inside of me, they can't tell me anything he didn't already tell me would happen. And he didn't already tell me in the Beatitudes, by the way, the Sermon on the Mount, the one Jesus gave, that blessed are those who are persecuted for the Jesus in you. The la- There's two levels of persecution, and the second one is that you're persecuted because of the Jesus in you. Well, trust me, in American Christianity, there's not much fear of persecution because of the Jesus in anyone. There is for the red and blue of it. There is for the Democrat or Republican. We'd know which one that is, but we would not know many people that exuded a Jesus in them to the level that they would want to take you out. But they do that in other countries just by asking, are you one? And they don't give it up. And you give it up with all the things in the world already. You have all the reasons to be thankful that you're in a country that supposedly there's freedom. But what is freedom if you don't have the freedom to think? 
And I watch all of you running around like plugged into the matrix all the time to this phone and the news and everything else and run around anxious and scared. Come to a class that I do and get scared off because this is the stuff we say all the time. So if you like it, I'll see you more than once a week. And if you don't, then you'll go home and watch the news and figure out if your career is going to save you or if the president's going to save you or anything else. When Jesus Christ already saved us by dying on the cross for our sins, it's sick and sad that this is the way that our country is. But it's because of bench warming Christianity that we got here. So if you love your life, you'll lose it. You already did. But if you find it in him instead, if you're willing to lose it for him instead, then there is nothing that they can do to not make you feel like this And I don't point at myself to point at myself and pat myself on the back anymore, even though I used to. I am thankful on my face most days that he saved me from that thing that you're in. I hated that life and had to pretend to love it so that I could pretend to show other people how to love it. That wasn't good. That wasn't right. But the more I love God by getting to know God, the stronger it gets. And the more I'm like, bring it on. And the more I can look in the Bible to when those times happen, that more of you want to do the same. I'm not the only one. It just feels like it sometimes. Right? Pastor has to feel the same way as he decided to do just no masks required in this country in 2020 and the craziness that started coming down on here. And then some of you got pulled in by that and should have because he didn't bow to man. He bowed to God. But we're a smaller church than the ones down the road that are going to pitch you the money in the politics and say, let's go. Right? Let's go. Hey, you're awesome. Y'all are doing great. Y'all are doing really good. You know, family and money and politics ahead of God, you're killing the deal. Right? And they just keep on giving to places like that. Your founding pastor and me, we're here to build radical disciples that are going to go out here and help other people because you don't have to help yourself anymore. You should be helped already and powerful already that you believe his word, that you're learning to love him with any of your heart, soul, mind, or strength. So again, we look at it and we try to figure out where we land. Are you an atheist, a self-professing believer, a radical disciple of Jesus Christ? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, evildoers. That's the reason for the tonality that I can't stop, that pastor can't stop, that we can't stop doing. That we have to tell you what's going on out there and serve you up the solution all the time. If we just tell you what's going on out there, we're no better than CNN. If we tell you what's going on out there and we show you the powerful cure so that you'll go out there and be lights in a time they think darkness is winning. I mean, what a joke. We already won. They think darkness is winning. They tell you darkness is winning so they can sway your vote or push your money in a position like the salmon swimming downstream that everybody is. But if you're swimming upstream, you know you're going to die. And the only way you end in that lake is your dead body floats into it. You don't consciously fly to it on purpose, right? And when your dead body floats down to it, your spirit is somewhere else. But not if he says, depart from me, evildoers, because he never knew you. We have to speak in the tonality that's right in the times that they're in. And let me be honest, I'm excited because I know something they don't know, right? I know something they don't know, and I'm going to tell you something they don't know. We used to have to plow the fields, right? We used to have to do the work. The enemy plowed the fields for us. They got everybody freaking out and scared. They plowed the fields for us, and we can plant the right thing in its place. Oh, you have fear? You're upset? So is everybody else. Let me give you the cure. It's not on social media. It's not on the news. It's not in your vote. It's not in your bank account. It's right here in the Word of God, living and active. You want some? They did the work for us. All we got to do is go plant the right thing. But instead, you go plant the same thing. You send your family members these little news things that they can see on their own. Oh, look at this social media post. Oh, look at this. It never surprises any of us or shouldn't. But what would surprise them, if you showed them the word of God living and active inside of them, if you showed Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit alive in you, the same power lives in you that raised Jesus from the dead. That has to be narrow as the path if you find it, because I don't find that almost anywhere, people that know that and embody that. But we as a church, we as a group right now, as we hear this message that you know doesn't come from humans, we could rally cry and do it. But again, I'm going to see most of you once a week. It's just the truth. I'm going to see you once a week. And hopefully that once a week is you're celebrating what you know and you're out there doing God's work because we need warriors in the spiritual war. We got plenty in the physical war. Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Self-professing believers, atheists, only thing that makes the cut is a radical disciple of Jesus Christ, which is a student of Jesus Christ, which would then be a radical disciple of Jesus Christ. 
He did radical things. He asks you for radical things. He asks you for to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A little bit would be a radical disciple. He tells you to love your life or you'll lose it. So we have to talk about radical things and do radical things. But here's the, here's the cool thing. If you love your life, if you love the things of this life, you should accumulate as much as you possibly can and try to enjoy it as much as you possibly can because it's the best life you're ever going to have. The next one isn't going to be awesome. And it lasts a tad bit longer. So we have to gather together to fellowship and create an army so people would want to be a part of, not one that the enemy comes over the mountain and we're already killing each other. Not okay. We need embodiment, not pretending to know anything. And that would be a radical disciple who loves God, connected to him and his word and each other. Nothing could break us apart. So why wouldn't we want to fight to that? And I don't have time to tell you what I wanted to end it with, so I'll just tell you his homework. Go read Romans 8 and prepare to be super excited only if you're a radical disciple of Jesus Christ. I'll pray us out. Father, we come to you in extreme thanksgiving for you, your presence in this broken existence that we were all once tricked by, everyone. Nobody is above not being tricked by their flesh. Even Paul wrote about it and then wrote half the New Testament. But when you come inside, you're looking for zeal. When you're in this vessel, you're looking for people who are radical disciples of Jesus Christ, your one and only son who came and died on earth so that those who believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But if you believe in Jesus and you know Jesus, then you work for Jesus, not for anything else, not for anyone else. So what we ask you for, Father, and here is for the message to be heard correctly, that individually we have to climb this ladder that leads to eternity, that we are infinite levels below Jesus Christ. And if we're looking at that every day, we don't have time to judge other people the wrong way, but we will judge other people the wrong way as they are confused and running the wrong direction towards an inescapable trap without you inside. Continue to sanctify us, Father, please. Mature us in the kingdom here and now so that we can be lights in this growing darkness. And it is in Jesus' powerful, strong, perfect name we pray. Amen.